Welcome to A Well Cared For Human, the podcast that tries to convince you that you are 100% normal and an even better than okay example of the human species, despite the fact that sometimes we feel like the craziest, most incapable, or worthless creatures on the face of this planet. I'm Corey, an author, a creative, and the host of the show. Whatever you're bringing to the table today, I hope this episode proves to be a dose of inspiration for you on your quest to become a well-cared-for human. You can find the episode show notes, your free wellness blueprint, and more at awellcaredforhuman.com. And as always, thank you for listening. Hello humans, it's your host Corey, and today we're going to talk about the endurance test. Sometimes there are difficult situations that we encounter and they are not easily fixed, nor can they be avoided altogether. Maybe someone you love is sick or they got injured or maybe you yourself got sick or were injured and it's going to be a long road to recovery. I've had friends who have had to take care of a loved one with Alzheimer's for a long time, another who had a very messy divorce that went on for several years, another one who was trying to resolve their father's estate, and that took many years, and it was a lot of lawyers and a lot of sorting and a lot of stress. There's horrible custody battle situations. My situation with Charlie with the last two or three years of his life where he was getting progressively more and more immobile and needed more and more care, that was an endurance test. Any of these long-term stressful situations, such as a demanding job or caregiving responsibilities or personal challenges that require us to be extra resilient and extra stable in order to sustain the damage because it's something that we're in it and we can't really get out of it. So we have to navigate it for the long term. Grief can also be like this if you're grieving someone that you love. So for example, when I lost my mother and everything that happened afterwards, everything I shared with you guys in the Who Killed My Mother podcast, that was an endurance test. Surviving the aftermath of her death was an endurance test for me. And going through that period of grief, it can test us emotionally. It can test us even taking care of ourselves and our relationships with other people in our personal growth journeys. So we are all trying to... I mean, I guess I can't say all of us. I don't know what you're trying to do. (laughs) But I assume that if you're here with me listening to this podcast, you're trying to make things better for yourself. You're trying to make your life easier. You're trying to find some source of strength or comfort to go forward. And so I call that the personal growth journey, so to speak. You guys know I hate that word journey, but the personal growth expedition. (laughs) That requires us to continuously confront emotions, trauma, challenges, and all of that feels like an emotional endurance test. And it doesn't matter if we're in a high stress environment, so we're doing all of this work and things are also really hard, maybe at home or in our friend circle or at work, or it could be a low stress environment. It doesn't matter because the situation is that we are stuck in it. Like we can't escape whatever it is. (laughs) There is no escape. And when there's no escape, you have to find ways to endure, to persevere. You have to find ways to sit with the difficulty of the situation without letting it overtake you or completely deplete you or send you into a despair spiral, which is very common, at least for me. (laughs) When I find myself in an endurance test, I'm definitely prone to despair cycles, that's for sure. And it's true that an endurance test doesn't always have to be caused by something negative. It could also be because you really, really want something. So maybe you're trying to build a business or you're trying to save up enough money to buy a house or to make some big financial change or you want to quit your job forever and move to Bali. I don't know. (laughs) But there's something that you really want and you have to stretch yourself kind of thin to get it either your time or your resources or your focus. And sometimes those circumstances are just really challenging because we have to stay completely present and focused on it, even though the circumstances around us aren't necessarily compatible with what we're trying to achieve. Or maybe it's just a really competitive space. So my journey as a full-time author, for example, is definitely an emotional endurance test. I had to go through everything I went through to learn how to be a writer, to actually write the books, to get the books published, to market the books, to find a way to continue to invest and enjoy what I'm doing, even though burnout is a real possibility. It's a big risk, even though I'm maybe not seeing the level of success that I was hoping for for myself. All of that is very emotionally challenging, even though I am doing something I want to do. It's something positive. It's something that I long for and I hope for. So in either case, whether it's a negative situation or a positive situation, 
An emotional endurance test forces us to stick with something for the long haul. But how we do that without running ourselves into the ground, how do we do that without being completely absorbed by the emotional stress, the pressure, the discomfort, that's the big challenge. Making sure that we are staying connected to our resilience, to our inner strength, to our capacity to manage stress, cope with difficult emotions, navigate difficult circumstances without getting overwhelmed or giving up. So how do we do that? How do we endure a challenging circumstance that we can't immediately be rid of. Either because we committed to it willingly, <laughs> like our dream or a competitive space, or we are committed to it unwillingly, like someone we love is sick or injured, but we can't leave them behind. We can't give up on them or give up on ourselves. So the first thing I usually do is identify my why immediately. I have to decide why I'm going to stick with this. Why am I going to invest in this? And it's going to have to be a good why, <laughs> a really powerful why, a why that I can write down, tape to my office wall, and keep coming back and looking at every time it gets so hard that I want to throw in the towel or that I want to give up or that I'm in the danger zone of going into that despair spiral of, oh my God, it's terrible and it's never going to get better and it's going to be like this forever. It has to be a really good why. So in the case of my writing career, I'm like, this is my one big dream. This is the one big thing I want for myself. And I don't want to die with any kind of regret. That's my big why, is I don't want to die with regret. And I know that that might seem bizarre, <laughs> but I like to be aware of the regrets of any situation. So when I'm enduring this challenge of being a full-time author, of working in this really competitive space, in chasing my dream of being successful, of trying to get my own projects out there, for me, that's freedom. For me, that's living the way that I want to live, doing what I want to do with my time, with my attention, with my energy. That's me being true to myself. And if I don't do that, if I gave up on that, I just know that I would regret it. If I gave up and exited this game so to speak, if I was just like, no, I said no to this endurance test. If I exit stage right, I would regret that I didn't stick with it, that I didn't see how far I could go, that I didn't commit fully to my dreams in this life. And working hard toward my dreams, because I have worked very hard toward my dreams, that does not mean I'm guaranteed success. Just because we work really hard on something doesn't mean that it's going to work out. That's a very sad and terrible truth. <laughs> But there's no guarantee that I'll ever see the results that I'm hoping for, some of the really big dreams that I have. So I've already experienced quite a bit of success that I can be very proud of, but I haven't experienced some of these other things. So for example, I want to be number one New York Times bestselling author. And I know that that seems silly and it's not a dream that really amounts to anything as far as changing the course of my life, but it's something I really want to see for myself. I would love to see one of my books or many of my books or stories turned into TV shows or movies just because I love TV shows and movies and so it would be really fun to see my stuff up there on the screen. And there's no guarantee that my work will help millions of people, which is something that I really want. I really hope that my words will reach millions of people. It will help them change their lives and encourage them to heal. But there's no guarantee that that's going to happen. So I know that while I'm in this endurance test. But what keeps me from giving up on the endurance test is my why of I don't want to die with any regrets. And I know I will regret if I give up on myself or these people that I'm trying to help. I'll regret not sticking with it until the end. And when I do get to the end of my life, <laughs> <laughs> and whether or not I achieved all that I hoped to, I still just want to be proud that I gave it my all, that I did what I knew was right for me, that I was true to who I was, and that I stuck to my why. So it's really important to identify early on why you're doing something and why you're willing to continue to endure the test. And it's not necessarily success is my point here, is that it's not going to be like, well, because I can't get this unless I do this. Well, there's no guarantee that even if you work really hard, you'll get the success that you want from this committing to this test. But is there something else embedded in this experience that is worthwhile for you? I also help to endure the emotional endurance test by seeing it as an opportunity to practice awareness. And you've heard me wax poetic at this point about awareness, awareness, awareness. Awareness gives us so much freedom. It gives us so much strength. It gives us so much peace of mind. Probably sick of hearing me say that. <laughs> but when we are an endurance test, it does trigger a lot of emotions and it triggers a lot of stress and it triggers these really difficult experiences. And that could be our opportunity to practice more awareness, to sit with that, to explore that, to figure out what's going on underneath. 
to practice courage. Remember all the transformational habits that I talked about last week? Courage, optimism, hope, trust. All of that is needed in an endurance test. When you're an endurance test, you need to have awareness. You need to have courage that what you're going to do matters to yourself if no one else. You can practice trust that maybe it will work out. That's the optimism. Trust in yourself and your abilities. So there's a lot of opportunity to practice these big transformational habits in an endurance test. I also found that when we are in these emotional endurance tests, it gives us an opportunity to practice coping strategies. And I do mean healthy coping strategies. <laughs> Not the maladaptive ones that we came out of childhood with just because we were trying to survive. I mean the healthy ones, like the mindfulness and the breathing exercises and the journaling and the finding ways to connect with joy and relaxation healthy coping strategies, connecting with others. So an endurance test is really fertile ground because it again helps us get really clear on what we want and why we want it, but it also gives us a playground for practicing all these really important skills and habits that we need to practice anyway. It also gives us an excuse to prioritize self-care. So we need to take good care of ourselves when we're in an emotional endurance test, and that's hard to do because usually our first instinct is to throw ourselves away and just focus on this thing that's demanding our attention, this other person who's sick, or our body that's not cooperating because it got injured. Of course, I'm thinking of my back injury that I'm still healing. So when we're doing this, when we're working with that, it's a constant reminder that, oh, I need to also get enough sleep. I need to also take care of my body. I need to also be continually acknowledging my physical, mental, and emotional well-being needs. It helps us to practice continuously coming back to ourselves, to making sure that we keep our wellness in the picture when we're caring for other people. It also gives us the opportunity to practice acceptance because emotional endurance is challenging. I feel like I don't need to say that <laughs> at this point, but emotional endurance is a very challenging situation. And because of that reason, it brings up a whole range of emotions and it puts us face to face with things that we can't change. I talk a bit about this in the helplessness episode a few weeks back, so you can also listen to that again. But when we're in a situation where we can't really make it go faster and we can't really get out of it, we're somewhat stuck in that sense. I mean, I don't really believe we're ever truly stuck. I think that we have a lot more power than we think we do. But there are some situations where we feel pretty stuck. It feels pretty solid. And so if we find ourselves in that situation, it's an excellent time to practice acceptance and to practice avoiding escalation, meaning making it worse for ourselves. So acceptance is... What is that saying? Please give me the wisdom to know the things I can change and the things I can't. It's a serenity prayer. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but practicing that in these endurance situations where we know that we're just going to have to sit with this and we can make it worse for ourselves by escalating it while we sit with it, or we can just learn to sit with it. <laughs> There's a great image in, I don't remember what the name of the meditation was that showed me this. I'm sure it comes from probably Pema Chodron's work. But this idea of be like a log. So imagine that you're just a log in the forest, on the forest floor, and you're just sitting there, right? You're not doing anything. You're being very steady, very put, so to speak. And so being like a log, it's supposed to conjure this image of not overreacting to a situation, not getting too emotionally invested in a situation, which is hard to do when we're an emotional endurance test because our habit is usually to escalate it, to make it worse, to start catastrophizing in our mind of this is absolutely the worst and it's going to be the worst forever and I'm never going to be able to escape this. It's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And when we're doing that, we're making ourselves more upset with these negative internal narratives. So during an emotional endurance test, it's really essential to control that negative narrative that might be forming in your mind and keeping it small as possible. <laughs> Don't let it get too big. Don't let it grow in there and fester because it's going to make your emotional endurance test feel a lot harder because now you're taking damage from both sides. It's not just your challenging situation on the outside. You're also making it really hard for yourself on the inside. And there's lots of ways I do that. I do use mindfulness to practice acceptance and to avoid escalation. I also try to take a lot of breaks. So taking a break from the situation, either mentally or physically, sometimes if I can physically walk away from something, that might be really good for me. Or maybe just mentally, just mentally put it down, <laughs> which is really hard to do. <laughs> like, just put it down because you'll find your mind going right back to it and you're like, no, we're actually not going to think about that right now. And just keep turning it away. Just keep putting it down. But allowing yourself to take those breaks to get that rest to help to lessen that emotional stress so that it doesn't become chronic, that it doesn't become burnout, that you don't keep storing all that in your muscles. And this is also usually a very good time to practice boundaries. When we're already dealing with a lot, if we can recognize that I am in an emotional endurance test right now, that would be the least productive time to say yes to something. Something else. 
<laughs> I mean, if it's something that brings you joy that would provide you relief from your emotional endurance test, absolutely say yes to it. But if you're saying yes to things that you don't need to say yes to, if you're not protecting your time, your energy, your emotional health, if you're over committing to things during challenging times, it's just going to feel even more like hell to you. Because now you're trying to do all of this on top of this thing that you're already doing. Just imagine that you were running a marathon. I don't know why you would do this, but I hear people enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I hear there's somebody out there. I'm sure one of you listening to this right now, you like to get out there and to run. I will only run if my life is dependent on it. I love to walk. I take really long walks every day, several miles every day, but I just don't love running. But just imagine that you were on a really long run and you're, I don't know, mile 15 and someone comes up to you and says, can you carry this 50 pound box for me? You'd be like, oh my God, no. Can't you see? <laughs> Can't you see I'm on mile 15 of this marathon? Are you kidding me? You need to have that kind of gusto when it comes to people asking of your time and your energy and your investment when you're in an endurance test. If you know you're in an endurance situation, don't say yes to things that people try to get out of you. It needs to sound as ludicrous to you as me saying, here's a 50 pound box, please carry it in the middle of this marathon. It needs to sound that silly to you when people ask of your time, when you know you don't have any capacity to give to anyone else right now. Just absolutely not. <laughs> Do not. And maybe that'll be your response. They'll be like, Do you want it? Absolutely not. I cannot. Thank you. <laughs> And there's nothing wrong with seeking support or getting professional help. So either in your personal life, if you've got trusted friends or family members or somebody who can support you during your emotional endurance test. For me, these don't even have to be people that know me. So for example, I get a lot of comfort listening to Pema Chodron's audiobooks. I have several of her audiobooks on my Audible app. And I will just listen to them on repeat. I mean, I think I've got like 10 or something. So I just have them in rotation. So when I'm feeling really stressed or really overwhelmed by something, I'll just turn on her voice and I'll just listen to her. And I find that really comforting. Or there's other people like podcasts and things where I just listen to them. Hopefully I can be that source for you as well. When you just need a kind voice in your ear telling you, absolutely, you can do this. Like, absolutely, you've got this. Don't even worry about it. Don't let it get you down. This will end. Hopefully not with your death. <laughs> But, you know, no matter what, this is going to end. It cannot go on forever. And so finding the things that give you energy, finding the things that feed you, whether that's great music or it's a comfort object or a comfort routine, like maybe you really like to put in a movie and eat some popcorn on a Friday night, decompress, treat yourself as if you're running a marathon and that this is a long-term commitment and investment and give yourself a break and find ways to recharge and Fill your own cup so that you can keep going, so that you can keep enduring it as long as you need to. And again, that can be either friends and family or even strangers you don't know, just their books or their materials that you find very comforting, very inspiring, very fueling, so to speak, or professional help. If you need a therapist or a counselor or someone to take you through the experience of losing someone. I went back to therapy when my mom died. When my mom died, I called a therapist like two weeks later. I was like, this is too much. I can't do all this by myself. And she was like, absolutely, let's break it down. And so I was in therapy for a couple of years after her death to work through all that. There's no shame in that. Getting help so that you've got support to move through something. Just know that endurance tests are by definition long. You know, you're in it for the long haul. And so whatever you need to do to fuel yourself as you're moving through that, if it's support, if it's books, if it's music, if it's breaks, if it's snacks, if it's a good friend, whatever that is, keep feeding yourself during that period of emotional endurance. And don't give yourself a hard time about it. Don't make it worse on yourself by telling yourself that you need to be stronger, that you have to do this and this. Be really gentle with yourself because you're already running a marathon. And it would be absolutely ridiculous to come up and give yourself a 50-pound box. <laughs> so don't make it harder. Don't beat yourself up. Treat yourself as you would if you were, for some reason, on this support team for this person who's running this marathon. You'd be there with the water saying, you can do this, absolutely. Be that person for yourself or find someone that you love who's close to you that you trust or a professional to be that person for you. But absolutely, the thing to remember is that an endurance test cannot last forever. One way or the other, it's going to end. And so the most important thing is for you to come out the other side of this as healthy, happy, and well as you possibly can. And to do that, we have to pay ourselves. And to pace ourselves, we have to keep filling our cup as much as we need to until it's all over. And that's it for today, dear human. As always, I hope you found this episode useful. If you would like to write into the show today and ask for my thoughts on something that you're dealing with, I would love to hear from you through any of my social media or through email at cory at coryamshram.com. Otherwise, I will be back next week with another episode of A Well Cared For Human. And until then, please take good care of you. This episode of A Well Cared For Human was written and produced by me, Cory Marie. 
The music was by Late Night Feeler and Esther Abrami. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider visiting my Patreon. For as little as a dollar a month, you get early ad-free access to the episodes, as well as a monthly patrons-only Q&A, bonus videos, and more. Not to mention that your Patreon support lets me know that you find value in the show and want it to continue. You can find me on Patreon by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash Corey Marie. If you can't support the show financially, that is okay. You can still subscribe to the show, leave a review of the show, and recommend the show to your friends, not just the neurotic ones. All of this helps so much. And as always, thank you for listening.